Hallelujah. Now, from that predestination, you were called. Some of you might think that you, uh, you had a lot to do with your salvation, that you were like smart enough to choose Jesus. No. <laughs> what the Bible tells us is that none of us is smart, of us, smart enough. We're all uh, you know, lost in our sin. We're, we've all fallen in uh, or we, are, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so left to ourselves, we would never choose Jesus. Just so you know. It's just not a part of who and you, you and I are in our sin nature. When we are born, we are born to be against God. It's who we are. But Jesus, remember what he said in John three sixteen, God so loved the world because God loved us. He sent what? He sent who? His only son? So the, uh, uh, whoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. So, so the, the sending part, the initiation of the process, it tells us in, in 1 Corinthians that, that Christ's, loves, uh, Christ's love compels us. It's like a tractor beam. This is all Star Trek. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, uh, we get in, like maybe you're here today for the first time, and you're like, oh, this God thing is kind of weird. But, but you, sung, you sang a song, and you're like, oh, man, there's something going on in my heart. This is weird. I've never felt this before. What is this? I'll tell you what it is. It's the love of God for you. And he's got the tractor beam on you. And he's like, you need me. Now your sin is saying, I don't need you. But his love is drawing you in. That's what it, when it says there, he calls us, that's, what he's, that's what's happening. He, and I told you at the front, everything about our salvation, front side, back side, God's, God's the, the initiator. He tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. He gets it going, and he keeps it going. So uh, he predestined us. He called us. What's justification? Justification is just another word for salvation. If you don't understand your salvation, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, it is a legal transaction. You're like, really? Yes, I thought it was a grace thing. Well, it is too. By grace you come. But then because you are in Christ, because he has paid your price, uh, the price for your sin, which is death, then that is legally accounted to you. You are no longer culpable for your sin because Christ has paid the price. And so you are legally, in God's eyes, justified. Not because of something you did, but because of what Jesus did. So, we can all get with that. Those of us who are following Jesus Christ, we get that, right? Predestined, called, justified. But here's what comes next. He pops this word glorified in there. Now, to my knowledge, nobody floated in here today. No one walked through the wall to come to church. Uh, you may have tried, but it didn't work. We are not in our glorified bodies yet. We do not uh, know all things and see all things as our big brother Jesus does. We are not yet glorified. That is yet to come. But how does Paul speak of our glorification, our being in heaven? He speaks of it in the past tense. He says, hey, all these things that we would all agree have happened for those of us who are following Jesus Christ, they've all happened in the past and they are current now, but now this thing that will happen in the future, he speaks of it as, he speaks of it as if it already has. Have you ever done that? I can do that right now. Watch this. Boston Red Sox, 2009, World Series champions. Now, I don't know if that's true, but I can be so confident in my team then I could talk like this game, this season, is already over. Bring it on, bring it on, right? I mean, I, and that's how fans are. They get so swept up. And so, and, and so Paul, speaking of his Savior Jesus Christ, and so confident that what God started, he will be faithful to complete, he says, hey, man, the glorification thing, it's a done deal. It's in the bag. It is on like a leprechaun. I don't even know what that means. I mean, this is just how it's going to be, Paul says. Uh, <laughs> there's never going to be a time in God's kingdom when all this earth is gone and we're all up there where, where Jesus is walking down the, the streets of gold and uh, he looks up at a house and he, and, he, and he sees that the lights aren't on and no one's been living there. And he looks and he's, you know, he's like, where are the Saunders? I mean, he was a preacher in a church, for crying out loud. Why is he not here? There's going to be no surprises in heaven. But if you believe that you can lose your salvation, if you believe that you have the power to overcome God's grace in your life, then you're saying that, that there's going to be surprises in heaven where God's going to have invested his son Jesus Christ into someone's heart, but they've, they've blown it. 
And they just never showed. It's like people not showing up to a party you invited them to. Oh, they couldn't make it. That's not going to happen in heaven. God's sovereign. He knows all things. He controls all things. And surely, the one who compels us and through his son saves us can hold us until eternity comes. Amen? Yeah, if, if, if we believe that, that we can lose our salvation, we're basically saying that the kingdom of heaven has natural selection. Anybody watch like Marlon Perkins, you know, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom growing up? Remember that? How's that for a blowback there, huh? Yeah. Now, I used to love watching the uh, predators pray. And natural selection is, is basically the science of slow animals, right? <laughs> That's what it is. Because the, the slow ones get eight, right? I mean, and so here's, here's what Christians who believe they can lose, you know, people can lose their salvation. They, you know, they believe that slow Christians get eight. That roaring lion that Peter talks about in 1 Peter 5 must have got him because, you know, they've been succumbed and whatever. And, and, so, so, and, and what that does is it paints this picture that heaven is populated by the, by the, by the fittest. It's the survival of the fittest. The, the fittest Christians made it to heaven. Okay, has anybody read the Bible lately? Uh, the, the, and I don't mean to be like condescending or pejorative, but the, but the people that make it into heaven, I mean, the Bible is just full of screw-ups. I mean, even the best ones are just messes, just total messes. And, and so if they're in heaven and they made it, aren't the rest of us messes going to be there too? I mean, heaven is populated by screw-ups redeemed by the grace of God. That's who's there. It's not the ones who were good enough and you know ran faster than the other ones and escaped the clutches of our adversaries. It's the ones who were saved fully, completely, forever by the grace of God. That's who's in heaven. We can't undo what God has done. Yeah, God the Father chooses us. It's called election. But God the Father defends us too. It's his protection. Hey, those rhyme. Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 5. Uh, go there if you've got a Bible. I'll wait for just a second, but here it comes. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter starts off appropriately by giving God his due. He says this, In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's salvation. You are born anew. The old has passed away. Uh, this new life begins. It came as a result of Jesus conquering death. You and I can conquer death and spiritual death because Jesus has. It's all through him, right? Okay. But it says this, uh, verse 4. Uh, he has given us new birth uh, through the resurrection and into an inheritance. He's, he's brought us into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. That's kept in heaven for you and I. I was uh, eating pizza yesterday at lunchtime. Sorry for that. I, I shouldn't have done that. I've confessed to my trainer. But it's really good pizza. Marco's Pizza, you ever had it? It's pretty tasty. Anyway. Uh, and I got the cheese bread too, but don't tell my trainer. Anyway, uh, but I was eating it yesterday, and I came up here to work, and uh, uh, I got it on the way, and I kind of ate it, and, and, but I couldn't eat it all. That's good news. Couldn't eat it all. So, uh, so I had like half a pizza and half a cheese bread left in the box. Now, I, I probably could have brought it in here into a refrigerator, but I, I didn't. I forgot. And I left it there in my car for about four hours. And then I drove to 60 and I preached for, you know, uh, and was there for another hour and a half. And so when I got home, my pizza and cheese bread had been in my car for six hours. Now, some of you are like, and I, I made fun of him first hour, so I'm going to do it again. Brad, I hope you're listening. But uh, some of you are like my friend Brad, the, the, the worship pastor. Anybody seen Monk on TV? That's what I call Brad, okay? <laughs> Brad's like this close to just walking around with like, you know, doctor's gloves on all the time. I mean, that's, he's going to have a hazmat suit on, you know, he's just, he's finicky about the germs and stuff. You won't eat uh, uh, hot lettuce. Is that what it is, Reba? I can't remember. Anyway, he's got all these little quirks. I love him. I love Brad. Uh, so if I had brought this pizza after sitting six hours in my car to Brad, uh, he would just vomit it right on the spot. He just would have puked right there. And, uh, you know, no, nah, he wouldn't have. But, uh, but he wouldn't have eaten it. I mean, you, you got to know he wouldn't have eaten it. Some of you wouldn't have eaten it. I'm, I'm eating it tonight for dinner. So, uh, <clears throat> and I don't care. I don't care what you say. You can tell me about germs. I don't care. It's good pizza. I'm not letting it waste. All right, so 